Hi, I'm Dustin Abbott, and I'm here for the final of my series of reviews of the new Siri Sniper series. This is a series of autofocusing f1.2 maximum aperture lenses designed for APS-C platforms like Fuji X-Mount, which I'm reviewing here, Sony E-Mount, and then also Nikon Z-Mount. I've also released a video where I looked at the series as a whole, and if you want to look at how they complement each other with identical physical designs, the ability to kind of hot swap them, and also uh, a consistent color tone throughout the series, you can check out that review there. These lenses retail for between $300 and $350, depending on your price point and whether you use a coupon, or you can get them as a total series for around $900 US dollars. In a nutshell, this is a really nicely built lens that uses premium materials. It has average autofocus for stills. It has rather poor uh, video focus. It has extremely nice bokeh, definitely a highlight, and it stops up very or sharpens up very nicely when it's stopped down. But wide open, it has a lot of chromatic aberrations re resulting in lower contrast. It's a modern lens in its build and its design, but it has a retro aesthetic, which is both good and bad, as we're going to see in this review. In a moment, we will dive into the overall details and overview of the build and handling, the autofocus, and the image quality. And if you want a deep dive into the optical results, you can see that at the end of the video, or you can jump ahead to that using the description below. Today's episode is brought to you by Into the AM, a clothing brand from Southern California that wants to outfit your passion, whatever it might be. Their everyday comfortable fabrics and designs are great whether you are working from home, working out, or even just chilling out. I love the fit and fabric on their everyday t-shirts, and you can choose more funky styles created in collaboration with local artists like this killer Fractured King hoodie. Use the code DUSTIN10 or follow the link in the description to get 10% off site-wide, including their monthly t-shirt club. Visit intotheam.com forward slash DUSTIN10 for more information. Now, 56 millimeters, when you apply the 1.5 times crop factor of the various uh, mounts that it is for, it results in a roughly an 85 millimeter equivalent lens. So this is essentially the portrait lens or the primarily portrait lens of the group, that being probably the most popular portrait focal length of all. So getting a big f1.2 aperture there is going to be extremely useful for that. Now, like the other lenses in the series, the overall dimensions are identical and like all of these lenses, you have the option of three different finishes. I've tested what they call the black, and its accents are actual genuine carbon fiber as on the barrel itself. There's also a silver that uses aluminum alloy accents, and then there is a white look that has a ceramic um, and a ceramic paint, paint baked into it as a part of the look. All of them are really, really stylish and definitely not carbon copies of other lenses that are out there on the market. All the lenses have an identical exterior dimension of 72 by right over 92 millimeters in length, 2.8 inches by 3.6 inches, a common 58 millimeter front filter thread. This is the heaviest of the bunch because the optical elements inside are gonna be the largest. It weighs in at 419 grams or 14.7 ounces. Now, as I mentioned, these lenses are really beautifully built. The focus rings are consistent in that they're to have a 360 degree rotation. So if you're happy to do manual focus and focus pulls uh, so that they perform consistently, for example, on a gimbal. But at the, the same time, I will note that here on Fuji, that if you get close to minimum focus, you have to make some additional rotations to get that extra little bit down to minimum focus. And that's more of a Fuji quirk, as I've noticed with many lenses over time and not specific to this particular series. So while things are very nicely made, there aren't any additional features. There's no switches on the side. There's no aperture ring. The one thing that it does have is there is a USB-C port in the lens mount. And that is very welcome because it allows you to do firmware updates to keep the lens future proof. And also it will allow them to tweak autofocus to maybe get a little bit better performance in the future. In this case, we do have an included lens hood. It's a little deeper and not pedal shaped. And that just reflects the fact that this is a telephoto lens and thus has a longer focal length as we're going to see even with the lens hood, lots of flare anyway. So a big hood, hood is probably welcome. The one thing that does set it apart here is there is a grip section a la Sigma that you know makes it a little more convenient for breaking loose or putting back on. So I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that inside we have 11 aperture blades 
blades. And so with a massive maximum aperture, that ability to maintain a circular shape as the aperture is closed down is something that's very welcome. Not so welcome as a minimum focus distance of just 50 centimeters. And as a byproduct, you get a quite low around 0.1 times level of magnification. Far from a macro lens, though fortunately you can tremendously blur out a background due to that big f1.2 aperture. Now focus here comes via an STM or a stepping focus motor. Focus speed is not bad, but as you can see here, it is what I would call slightly below average. Not that it's slow, but you can actually see focus taking place as something comes into focus, whereas so many of the, the modern lenses, focus is basically instantaneous. It just jumps from one subject to another. In this case, it's a little bit more deliberate than that. The overall noise of focus is not bad. You will hear a light clicking and whirring sometimes during video capture if focus is moving around. But what you will hear above all is the snap of the aperture blades opening and closing. Because as you go to focus, aperture blades will pop open to the preset aperture. But when you're done, they close back down to a smaller uh, aperture setting. And so as a byproduct, you will hear some clicking as those open and close. Now, the actual autofocus accuracy on this Fuji X-H2 body that I used for review was actually quite good. I found that overall, I was able to get good focus accuracy. I found that it tracked the eye quite well, as you can see here. And as I move around, it's able to stay locked on that eye and continues to maintain good focus in that regard. For stills, while it's not fast enough, I wouldn't say for sports or action, not a lot of f1.2 lenses are, but I, I think that outside of that, for most people in most applications, for stills photography, you'll have no problems. Autofocus will serve you just fine. The video side of things is not nearly as good, however. I found that the video for focus pulls, it was very slow to react. There's definitely some hunting, some visible steps. It's just not great. In my hand test, it just shows a really, really low reaction time. And so it, when I you know, cover with the hand, it takes a while to transition to that hand. So even though I was deliberately slow, by the time I moved my hand away, sometimes focus was not all the way there. And then it just kind of lingers there for a bit and then starts to move back towards the eye and vice versa. And so overall, the only plus I would say on the video side of things is that focus breathing is fairly low for a 56 millimeter lens. But other than that, this is obviously not a top choice for video work. Fo focus is just not reactive enough for, for action or really for video purposes. So a quick sketch of the image quality, and if you want more details, dive into the image quality section. But there are 12 elements and 11 groups, including one ED element, 4HR. This lens has what I would call quite a retro personality in that it is low contrast, wide open. There's actually a reasonable amount of detail, but the contrast is so low, you don't necessarily see it. And if you have shiny surfaces, there will be a lot of uh, chromatic aberrations, longitudinal style chromatic aberrations. And so that tends to give it kind of a dreamy look wide open without a lot of contrast. If you stop the lens down after about f2.8, it starts to really start to, sh to sharpen up. And by the time you get to landscape apertures, it's you know fully modern, high contrast, good detail, even on a 40 megapixel sensor. And so it really has that dual personality that you have to actually want and not everyone does. In some ways, it reminds me of the old Zeiss classic planar 50 millimeter f1.4. And that lens was quite soft, dreamy, wide open, and then quite sharp when stopped down. Something that it does well is that it has really, really low vignette, just about a stop of vignette in the corners. There's a little bit of pincushion distortion. As mentioned, there are definitely chromatic aberrations and there is severe amounts of flare. And that flare takes a lot of, takes a lot, it makes a lot of different looks. And so some of them could be artistic, but in other cases, you may be annoyed by them. And if you don't like flare artifacts in general, this is definitely not the lens for you. Overall, the lens does have some redeeming qualities and does produce some nice images, but it's really for a particular type of photographer. And so in conclusion, I would say that I like this lens better than the 33 millimeter, but this is not a lens for those who value sharpness and contrast at wide apertures. 
You're probably better served by choosing a lens like the Sigma 56 millimeter F1.4 if you value high sharpness and contrast wide open. By contrast, I think the bokeh is a lot nicer from the Siri lens than what it is from the Sigma, but it's, it's a trade-off to what you prefer. If you're not stuck on 56 millimeters and you want a little bit of both, and you don't mind a little bit larger lens, try the Viltrox Pro AF 75 millimeter F1.2. It's a lens that is both very sharp and also has a really nice soft bokeh. It kind of gives you all of the things, but obviously different focal length and a little bit larger than what some people like. The lens is competitively priced, I believe. That's not a bad price for an autofocusing F1.2 lens but it, you need to be sure that you are the kind of photographer that this lens will benefit from. And if you like a little more of a retro look where skin tones are gonna to be softer and you, know, you don't see all the definition of all the pores and all of that, this is a lens that might work well for you. And if you just like the look of more artful looking images, I do think it has that quality to it, plus it gives you autofocus. So I think that there is a market for this lens. I just don't think it's a large and general market. But if you've always wanted an autofocusing lens with the retro vibe, this is it. Stick around now if you want a deep dive into the image quality performance, or you can check out the description down below and check out my text review in the image gallery and their buying links there as well. Let's dive into the image quality. So we'll start by taking a look at vignette and distortion. This has been an area where this series has actually done quite well, and that's no exception here. We can see that there is a bit of noticeable pin cushion distortion, but in my manual correction on the right, you can see it was very linear and corrected perfectly, very easily. We can also see that for an f1.2 lens, there is remarkably low amount of vignette there in the corners. So my corrections took the form of a minus four to correct the pincushion distortion and then a plus 37, just a little over one stop to correct for the vignette in the corners, which is de uh, definitely better than competing lenses that I've seen. Of course, just as good as this series has been when it comes to vignette and distortion, it has been this bad when it comes to uh, chromatic aberrations, particularly the longitudinal style that we see here. And so you can see some pronounced fringing both before and then after the plane of focus. Unfortunately, that is going to show up as fringing um, around specular highlights, bokeh circles here, you can definitely see that fringing around those. But then also, as you can see on the various shiny surfaces here, there's lots of fringing there as well. There is also a little bit more of lateral chromatic aberrations in this lens than what I've seen from other lenses in the series. You can see that on either side of these uh, black and white transitions. Uh, fortunately, this is the kind that corrects very easily with the one click correction, but as an aberration, this is actually a little bit worse than other lenses. Now, all the various aberrations that make up the lens designs it does rob contrast from these lenses. And you can see here, uh, unlike the 33 millimeter that really didn't have a lot of detail on the textures, I actually see reasonable uh, detail here, but what you see is just extremely low contrast, kind of like that Vaseline smear over the textures, kind of a blooming effect that robs away the contrast. In the mid-frame, again, mid-frame result at f1.2 is not bad other than the really low contrast. There is sufficient detail there, but it's obscured by the low contrast. And even into the corners, there's a reasonable amount of corner performance, but that low contrast does take away from it. Now for some perspective, here's another f1.2 lens, and this is the Viltrox Pro AF 75mm f1.2. Now, you might want to sit down for this. Here's the comparison. Ouch! That is a lot more contrast and detail for the Viltrox compared to the CRI 56mm. Now, no, these aren't identical in terms of focal length, but just look how incredibly sharp that Viltrox lens is by comparison. That mid-frame is just startling different. And even to the corners where the Viltrox is the weakest, you can just see it is such higher contrast. So that's an area where the Viltrox is really exceptionally good, and frankly, the CRI is not. I haven't really noticed a significant improvement with any of this series by stopping down a little bit to f1.4. That continues to be the case here. You can mostly just see that we've got a little bit more contrast. Shadows in, in particular just are a little bit deeper, but that overall kind of haze is still there to the textures. 
Stopping down from F1.4 to F2 does make a difference. We're definitely not all the way there yet, but you can see that now the textures are starting to show up. Mid-frame is looking okay, not exceptional. The corners, um, they're not vastly improved, but because expectations tend to be a little bit uh, lower in the corners, things don't look all that bad there. From F2 to F2.8, we see a little bit more market improvement to where things are starting to look good there, though frankly not as sharp as what we saw even at F1.2 from the Viltrox. From F2.8 to F4, there is another improvement. Now if we take a quick look here, we can see mid-frame is looking pretty good. Oh, let's look how we're doing for centering on the other side. We can see looking pretty good there, down here on the left side. Some improvement if we move over to this left corner, starting to look pretty good there. Up in the upper left, uh, you know, about the similar level improvement. Upper right, we can see that it's certainly not uber sharp, but it is improved. So by f5.6, things are starting to come together to where the lens is, in real world use, is quite crisp. And so we're seeing now that mid-frame looking good, and even down into the corners, the corners are starting to look good, though contrast is still not super sharp there. Now, while I never felt that the 33 millimeter got exceptionally sharp, um, even at smaller apertures, in this case, I think the 56 millimeter does genuinely get pretty much sharp across the frame. This is at f5.6, and at 40 megapixels, I'm actually quite happy with this result right down into the corner. I have no complaints about that. Here's another result from f5.6, and again, if I punch into a pixel level there, you know, there's good amount of detail, and that detail runs right off to the edge of the frame, so uh, no, no complaints at small apertures. You stop it down, the lens does become nice and crisp. Between f5.6 and f8 is pretty much as sharp as what we get. After that, diffraction does start to soften the image. But what's been interesting with this series is because they're not particularly high contrast at larger apertures, they comparatively don't look all that bad at minimum aperture. So you can see here at f16, yes, contrast has been reduced somewhat again, but it looks better than what it did at wide apertures. And so it's, it's still usable. And so I would say that you could use this all throughout its range. And again, this corner performance doesn't look too bad for f16. Now minimum focus distance if you're shooting at f1.2 does remain you know quite low contrast. Again if you look there at the actual detail that there the detail is not bad but the contrast is terrible and there's some fringing that shows up even in a shot like this. Where the lens compensates for all of that low contrast is in the defocused area. If anything, it's like the anti-Sigma 56mm f1.4, a lens that I thought was just beautifully sharp even at f1.4, but the quality of the bokeh was not that great because it was so high contrast. In this case, the opposite is true. The contrast on the subject is not great at all. However, the actual image looks quite nice because the bokeh is so soft and uh, nicely blurred out. In this series, actually, I shot first at f1.2, and so you see your kind of available options for tackling a scene. And I, here's where I think the value might be. On the subject, contrast is, as you can see, a little bit soft, but you can see that the, bl the blur is really nice. Stopping down to f1.8 helps to improve contrast somewhat. Now the detail, I think, is, is sufficient for most purposes. The bokeh is not quite as soft, but still looks pretty good. And then at f2.8, obviously the background is not as blurred, but more is in focus and the contrast and detail is better in that plane of focus. So you have different options with this lens on how you want the image to actually look. This image here is actually a combination of an f1.2 aperture shot that gives you that beautifully creamy background. And then I shot it f2 on the subject and then combine those together. And so f2 gives me enough contrast that in a real world use, I think that looks really quite nice. I'm happy with that as a shot. And then of course I'm getting the beautiful blur that comes from the f1.2 aperture. So there's another way you could handle it. This shot here, which was part of my kind of sample testing for the IAF, you can just see how beautifully blurred out the background is. That's definitely a strength for the lens. Now, finally, a look at flare resistance, because as you can see in this particular, just the position of the sun coming through the window here is just kind of flooded this image with light. It's actually an artistic effect that I, I like fine. Um, in this shot here, I just compose a little bit differently, and so we have a little bit of a prismatic veil there, but overall you can see that there's a little bit more contrast in the scene.
This shot is actually interesting because one of the things you'll get is kind of a flashing effect. And so you can see that on display here. It comes across, I think, as being artistic, but it all depends on how you're going to compose. And so here, if we take a look, kind of panning across uh, in video mode, you can see there's just a huge variety of different flare artifacts and uh, different effects that are there. And so maybe you love, maybe you hate those. Stop down, I don't like any of them quite as much because it's just a little bit more in your face and pronounced. You can see that flashing effect though there at the end. Well, if you've stuck around to the end, thank you so much. Have a great day and let the light in.